Hey guys, Jeremy Waddell from theoryofcardiology.com. I um, want to give you guys a quick presentation here on the EKG machine, what it's doing, how it does it, and uh, what exactly it's trying to tell you. So first off, what you have to understand is that an EKG machine um, has a standard sweep speed of 25 millimeters per second. Now that is how fast the paper is moving um, under the pins. So on most EKG machines, what you have are four pins in a perfectly straight line um, arranged like this. And then the piece of paper, the actual EKG paper, simply slides to you know, the left at 25 millimeters per second. Um, and as it does that, each of these four pins are graphing something um, as far as electricity. And so all these pins do then are move vertically. So they're either gonna move up the page or down the page. But the left to right motion is all controlled by how fast the paper here actually moves under the pins that direction. Now, um, on standard paper, um, all EKGs everywhere use this paper. Um, you can tell here that you have big boxes like that, but then also you have tiny little boxes that are only about that size. Um, so each big box has five small boxes within it. Kind of like that. Um, and so each box um, is telling you something. So going this direction, um, each one is millivolt. So one millivolt, two millivolt, three, four, five millivolts. Um, and then going this direction is 0 0.04 seconds. So if you have 0 0.04, 0 0.04, 0 0.04, 0 0.04, 0 0.04, you have 0 0.2 seconds per actual big box. Um, and so you can see that right here that from one big line to the next big line is a total of 0 0.2 seconds. Um, you can also see here that vertically a box is five millivolts. So based, and that's all assuming standard sweep speed of 25 millimeters per second. Now, um, since we know that one big box is 0 0.2, then five big boxes then would be one second. And so based on that, we can time things on an EKG for what's happening. So for example, um, this little waveform that you see right here, that little hump right there between those lines, that's the P wave, that's the atria depolarizing. And then you have the big spike sitting there between those, that's the ventricle depolarizing. So if we wanna take a measurement um, over here of the time that the atria starts to the time that the ventricle starts, um, you can see here that comes out to 0 0.16 seconds. So I now know how long it takes for the atria to depolarize. Um, and I've got the time from the beginning of atrial depolarization to the beginning of ventricular depolarization. So just remember the two axes, axes. Um, this direction is millivolts. This direction is time. Uh, reviewing here kind of the, the general electrical system of the heart, um, just the, a presentation or two ago, we talked about that. Um, but what we need to look at though is the actual QRS complex. Um, and so we have three distinct waveforms in sinus rhythm. We have a P wave, followed by a QRS complex, followed by a T wave. So your P wave is this thing here in green, um, and that's the atria depolarizing. We then have what we refer to as a PR interval, and that's the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS. Um, the Q wave is this downward spike here. The R is this upward one here and the S is this down one, downward one down here. You then have an ST segment, which goes from the end of the QRS complex, the end of the S, um, to the beginning of the T. That's the little ST segment. But when we measure a QT interval, which is frequently measured, we're going from the beginning of the Q wave 
to the end of the T. Um, because the QRS complex is telling us ventricular depolarization, but the T wave is ventricular repolarization. So the beginning of a QRS complex to the end of a T wave is one complete cycle of the ventricle depolarizing and repolarizing. Um, there are certain parameters for how we want that to be. Um, we don't want the ventricle to take too long to actually repolarize. Um, but what you can see here is we talked about how depolarization starts in the AV node, or I'm sorry, the SA node, and travels down to the AV node. As that happens, the atria depolarizes, and on our EKG, we are going to see the P wave show up. Now, the AV node is then going to hold this depolarization for somewhere around 120 um, milliseconds. And so what we end up with is a total time from the time the SA node depolarized, the atria starts depolarizing until depolarization starts to enter the ventricle. So start of atria to start of ventricle. Um, we can measure with that PR interval, and that should be 120 to 200 milliseconds. So the time it takes for the atria to depolarize, the AV node to hold that depolarization, and then pass to the ventricle is about 120 to 200 milliseconds. Now, um, notice here, you can see that from here to here is the actual P wave, that's the atria depolarizing. But then the AV node will hold depolarization, um, and that's then what's happening from here to here, because notice that in this little segment, electrically nothing is happening. Um, this is not some big waveform sitting way up here or anything like that. It's just zero. It's just flat, because nothing is happening right then. Depolarization is just kind of sitting in the SA node. Now, um, so we've got our P wave when the atria depolarized. We're then going to get this little PR segment where it sits in the AV node. Then, as it comes down the bundle of Hiss, we're going to see a very quick rightward depolarization. Remember that the septum depolarizes first off the left bundle towards the right. And so when we get our little rightward depolarization, that's going to give us this tiny little Q wave um, that we see right here. Then we're going to get the big depolarization that's going to appear to go towards the left. And so we're then going to see the big spike. And depending on exactly which lead you're looking in, you may have an S wave, you may not. Um, some just stop there and go right into that ST segment. Others may come down and up and then into it. We'll talk about that again in a second. And then everything is going to repolarize bottom to top through the ventricle, we repolarize upside down. Um, and so we then get our waveform there. So P, Q, R, S, and T. There are your three basic waveforms, atria, ventricle depolarization, ventricle repolarization. Atrial repolarization is electrically a very minor thing and it's happening under this QRST all that the atria depolarizing in there now um, on page 69 and 70 um, we talk a little bit about what exactly we're seeing as far as timing right so remember on an EKG timing is width so if we look here if the left ventricle takes that long to depolarize the right ventricle takes that long to depolarize. And if they depolarize simultaneously, then it makes sense that your simultaneous depolarization is that. So let's say the left ventricle takes 100 milliseconds, the right ventricle takes 100 milliseconds. If they both depolarize at the exact same time, the total time is 100 milliseconds. But what if the left takes his 100, the right takes 100, but the right is late and depolarizes after the left has already started. Well, then now what you're going to end up with is from there to somewhere over here is 100. But then you have all this left here. So you're going to end up with like 50 more or whatever you get in that particular patient of time where the right ventricle is now way out here depolarizing totally by itself. 
So now you have a total time of 150. So anytime your QRS complex gets wide, what that's telling you is that your ventricles did not depolarize at the same time um, because something went later than something else. In this example here, where we're talking about the right ventricle depolarizing late, um, what we're looking at usually is something like a right bundle branch block. So if you go back to the anatomy chapter, um, this one right here would be the right bundle going down the moderator band there. So let's say we had a, a heart attack or some other little dead spot right in here. Um, and so for whatever reason, as depolarization is coming down this right bundle, it's going to hit this little spot and stop. So what depolarization then does is, as it spreads through the myocardium here, it'll eventually spread down. It'll get back on the bundle down here, and then it'll take off that direction like that. But remember that myocardial cells are very slow conducting. So while the left bundle went ahead, ran down all of its fascicles and started depolarizing, the right was here and it was starting to run through the myocardium. Well, then the left ventricle completely depolarizes and it's done. And then some point later, the right bundle then is able to complete its depolarization. So while both of them may have started up here at the AV node and the bundle of Hiss, like that, while they started simultaneously, the right took so long to actually depolarize that we'll end up stretching out our total QRS time because the right is gonna end up going so late. Similar thing can happen on the left bundle. Um, if you were to block the left bundle right there, if depolarization ran down the right normally, but it got slow here around the left, then you would still get this wide complex, but it's gonna be reversed where the right would be going first and the left would be going late. So what are, is the EKG actually doing? So the EKG, we refer to it as a 12 lead um, because it gives us 12 leads or 12 different views is how you can think about it. Um, so by putting 10 stickers, 10 wires on a patient, we produce 12 views because we're gonna compare what we're seeing at some of these stickers to actually produce them. So if you look right here, you can see this number one sitting here and this is up on page 61 of your book. So take a look there and follow along. You can see that you have a number one up here and a number two there. Now in this image here, let's say that this gray truck here is traveling that direction. Now, if you were standing right here at number one, you would say that the gray truck is going away from you. But if you're standing over here on this side of the road, you're gonna say that the gray truck is coming toward you, right? Because he's going left to right and you're further right than he is. So you're gonna say he's coming toward you. Now, that only gives us so much information because Notice that this gray truck, number one says it's going away from him, but what if the gray truck was sitting right here and going that way, it would still be going away from number one, so he would report it as away. Similarly, the gray truck could be sitting here going this direction. Number one would tell you that it's going away from him, but number two would tell you it's coming toward him. So by simply knowing that one says it's going away from them, two says it's going toward them, I have a general idea of what the truck is or is not doing, but I can't completely pinpoint it yet because it may be there going to the right or it may be here going down. Either one would give me an away from number one and a toward from number two. Now, similarly, this red car here, who is way over on the right side of the image, um, since number two is to the left of it, as it's heading towards the left, number two here for a second is going to tell you that it's getting closer to them. But then at some point, it's going to cross over here, and now it's going away from number two. So number two is going to tell you it's coming toward for a short period of time, but then it's going to go away from them. Number one sitting up here is going to see the car as far as this image is concerned, always just coming completely toward them um, all the way to right here. So he's going to see all toward. Um, and so by comparing 
different people in different places, right? So I could put person three up there, person four down here, five in the middle, six over here. It doesn't matter where. But by some point, if I have 12 people standing here and everybody tells you whether something's coming toward or away from them, you will eventually be able to figure out exactly where the vehicle is and exactly what direction it's traveling. So what the EKG does is tells us toward or away. And so if we're going toward that lead, the QRS will be positive. If we're going away from that lead, it will be negative. But notice that if depolarization is moving perfectly perpendicular to us, we're gonna see up then down. Why? Because just like that guy number two, um, if this right here is the lead, depolarization starts here and travels th like that, then from this position here, you're gonna say it came toward you, then away from you. So notice down here, what you get is toward, which is up, but then you get an away down here. So that tells you that it's moving perpendicular to you in some fashion because it went some toward, but then some away. Um, another little interesting comment though, is notice that you don't ever have an away then a toward. That's never a thing because, let me clear this out and start over. Um, if here is our lead there, if the car is right there, for him to go away from our lead, it would have to go that direction, in which case it will always be going away. Right, it's never gonna then magically just pop out over here and start coming back toward, like that. Um, so you can have a toward then away, but you cannot have an away then toward. Now this other image, um, this chart right here, um, what this is showing is the 12 different leads that we have. One, two, three, AVR, AVL, AVF. V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. Um, so there's your 12. And then what it's what I'm telling you here, which is very confusing when this is new to you, is which leads, which wires are we using? So lead one, for example, is using the right arm lead and the left arm lead, and it's comparing the voltage at those two places. Um, and by doing that, it's gonna graph the voltage in those two, and then the end result is that that's going to be telling you what's happening on the high lateral wall. We're getting to that in a minute. Um, this chart is very confusing, but it will help you kind of as you go through and figure out all this. Um, so here's your standard EKG. Remember um, back on that very first slide, I mentioned the four pins. Well, here they are. Pin one, pin two, pin three, pin four down here. Um, now, what we're gonna do then is we're gonna pass this piece of paper to the left at 25 millimeters per second. And then these pins, all they're gonna do is just move up and down based on the voltage that they're recording at any given period in time. So notice here, this very first QRS complex, this one right here in lead two is almost all upward. So what this is telling you is that depolarization essentially moved toward the lead the entire time. Um, now, if the um, if we look though, like up here at lead one, right there, notice we're toward then away. And so by knowing the locations of the leads, we can put all this together. Um, the general layout for an EKG is one, two, three. We get those for two and a half seconds. Um, we then go into AVR, AVL, and AVF for two and a half seconds. We'll then go into V1, V2, V3 for two and a half seconds. And then unfortunately, um, the rest got cut off. We have V4, V5, and V6 that we then record over here for two and a half seconds. Um, so 10 seconds total on the piece of paper, um, two and a half in the first column, two and a half in the next, two and a half in the next, two and a half in the next. Um, notice though I mentioned the four pins. You have the fourth one down here. 
it's just going to continuously record lead two um, for the duration of the entire EKG just to give you one good long strip. Um, so based on how we know how the pens and paper move, notice then that that beat right there in lead one is that beat there in lead two, which is that beat there in lead three, which is that beat there again in lead two. Um, but notice that the first beat here in lead one is not the same heartbeat as this first one over here in AVR. Because remember the EKG machine read for two and a half seconds here, then it read another two and a half seconds over there. So that first beat happening here in AVR was roughly two and a half seconds after this beat. So if we're gonna count them, there's beat one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. There is beat number one. There is beat number seven. There is beat number 11. So you can compare beats vertically on an EKG because that was the same beat, but you cannot compare that one with that one because they happened eight or nine seconds apart. So how do we do this? If you look on, starting on page 76, um, first we put four leads on. You get one on the right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg. Um, and using these, what we can do is we can take the right arm electrode, compare it to the left arm electrode based on how much voltage each of them are seeing. And there we have produced lead one. If we compare right arm to left arm and look for what is flowing towards the left arm, right, there it is, um, from this direction. So you have a negative lead over here and a positive lead over there because I need to know, I'm looking at what's coming towards the left arm, but I need to know what direction I'm referring to because what's moving that way or what's moving that way, that's two very different things. So you're always gonna compare leads from a negative towards a positive. So if I wanna know what's going from the right arm towards the left arm, I've got lead one. If I wanna know what's going from the right arm down to the left leg, I have made lead two. And if I wanna know what's going from the left arm to the left leg, I have made lead three. Um, so there are three directions. Um, notice it's essentially 60 degrees in each of those angles. Um, so what you have, it, ugh, that's bad. What you've ended up with is lead one is straight across like that. Lead two was going down like that and lead three was going down like that. So one was that way, two was that way, and three was that way. Um, based on where I'm putting the arrow, that's telling you the positive lead. That's the direction we're looking for travel. Um, now, that's your first three. If you remember on the EKG, it was one, two, three then AVR, AVL, AVF is the next column. So we produce those by doing this over here and it's not any more complicated, the picture is just more complicated. So if I take th whatever I'm reading, the voltage at the right arm, so up here, I then take the voltage of the left leg, let's say he sees four volts and he sees six then electrically what's happening dead center of those, if I average them, it would be five. So I now know that if this is four and this is six, then this point right here must be five. So I'm gonna take the average of the right arm and the left leg. I'm gonna compare that to what I'm seeing at the left arm and that produces AVL, augmented voltage of the left arm. Um, so average the other two stickers, so the right arm and the left leg, um, take that average, make that the negative point, compare it to the other one, and you've produced the augmented voltages. So augmented voltage of the right shoulder or the right arm, I would average the left arm with the left leg, find that point right there, and that's going to give us 
that, which is AVR, augmented voltage of the right arm. We just talked augmented voltage of the left. Augmented voltage of the foot. Let's take the right arm. Let's take the left arm. Average those to find that midpoint. And then let's go straight down to the left leg. And you have augmented voltage of the foot. So AVF. Um, notice that the right leg lead was never used. Um, electrically, we're never using it. It's essentially an electrical ground. So it's never used in any of the actual calculations. But with most machines, if that right leg lead comes off, you lose everything because it's electrically the ground. So this guy right here is telling you how to find one, two, and three. This guy right here is telling you how to find AVR, AVL, and AVF. Now, earlier I showed you that we had lead one, two, and three, kind of like that, if we pick them up. Um, so notice that lead one is going straight across to the right. So notice here it's straight across to the right. Two is coming down this way at about 60 degrees. So here is lead two down there at 60. This one is going that direction, so he's down here. Now, if I then take my augmented voltage leads, so we have AVF is going straight down. We have AVL going up that way, AVR going up that way. If I were to pick up all of these lines here at their midpoints and stack them all with their midpoints right here in the center of this circle, this chart here is what we're going to end up with. So notice that lead one is coming over there. Lead two is down there. Lead three is down there. Then AVF was straight down, right, right there. So now I have AVF going straight down. AVL, which was that line, is now up here. And AVR, which was that one, is now up there. And so in one of the earlier presentations, we talked about um, how when we're looking at vectors, you have 0, 90, negative 90, and 180. Um, and so based on those angle measurements there, you can see that lead 1 is looking at 0, AVF is at 90, 2 is at 60, 3 is at 120, and so forth. So where these leads are looking per se is exactly how they look on this chart so if this right here this big round black ball here if that was the left ventricle you can see that avl is looking really high up here on this lateral wall um, because this side here would be the septum this side here would be lateral so this down here would be inferior and so you can see that AVL is looking very high up here on the lateral wall. Lead one is looking down here at the lateral wall. But then notice that two, three, and AVF are all looking down here very inferiorly. So they're looking up from the bottom. Um, and AVR is looking on a heart. It's looking way up here somewhere. Um, and because of that, it's not really electrically very useful because as far as its location, it's looking way off somewhere at your right shoulder. So as far as locating things, forget that AVR exists um, because it's simply not helpful. Um, here, I kind of show you the same thing, how if we looked at this, you can see that AVL is sitting way up here, kind of this high lateral wall. Um, so AVL is all this up in here. You can see that lead one is going to come through right there. Notice that two, I'm sorry, two, AVF, and three are looking down here. So these are very inferior looking. These are very lateral looking. And then, as I mentioned, AVR is looking way out here somewhere, so forget it exists. Um, how are we actually producing these? Um, for the next six, we're instead of doing right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg, we're going to put six V leads right across the chest. Um, you can see here we sit right in between the ribs with V1 on the right side of the sternum, because right there is your sternum. 
lead V2 goes to the left. V4 is the center of the clavicle. So if you find where your clavicle is up here, that being that bone there, find your clavicle, come straight down, you'll hit V4. Um, this is slightly kind of misdrawn looking, but essentially if you follow the anterior axillary line, so if you put your arm down against your left arm down against your side, um, the line that's produced there where your side hits your shoulder or your arm right there in the very front, if you come down from there, you get lead V5. V6 is dead center under your armpit. It's all the way lateral on the side of your chest. It's no more towards the front than the back. We want to be right under the armpit, very lateral. Um, so then V3 just goes halfway between V2 and V4. There's no real landmark for it. But what you can see though here is if we had a heart in there, um, like that, you can see that V1 is looking very much to the right. So V1 and V2 end up picking up kind of this septal territory. Um, but then as we come across V3 and V4, so these guys are septal, they're gonna kind of catch the anterior wall of the left ventricle. Then by the time you get to V5, V6, you're going so far around, you're picking up more of the lateral wall over there. Um, and so I don't know why this all got cut off but there would be V4, there's V5, there's V6. So what you get is at V1, you're talking the right side of the septum. You come around this way to V2, now you're talking the left septum. By V3 and V4, you're moving very anterior on the heart. Keep going, by the time you get down to V5, V6, you're very lateral again. Um, and so kind of looking at this guy here, no, those arrows are not coming out of his head. They're coming out of his AV node down in his heart. What I really want you to notice, though, is V2 ends up reading what's coming straight out the front of your chest. V6 is looking for what's traveling straight out the left side of the body. And then you have 22 and a half degrees between all of these here. Um, so V1 is looking 22 and a half degrees toward the right. It's the only right looking lead we use. Um, and then V3, 4, 5, and 6 are sitting in there. Um, but you can tell that V1 and V2 would be kind of catching the septum right in here. Um, and if this is that far lateral wall over here, you can see how V3 and V4 just kind of pick up that anterior wall right there of the left ventricle. Now, um, while I think this is a, a good, accurate description, it's backwards of how we typically view the heart um, because we typically look at a heart more like this. And so here you can see that V1, V2 catch the septum, three and four catching the big anterior wall, five and six over there are very lateral. Um, and so again, looking at this heart here, this is one from one of the first couple pages of the book. Um, but if you need something else to reference, here it is. So V1 is catching the right septum, V2 the left, three and four are coming right through that anterior wall. Then you have five and six with six sitting a little posterior to V5, right? Because V5 was catching up here, six is catching around the side. Um, so if we put all of this together, um, remember that on the axis chart, two, three, and AVF kind of sat down there like that on the bottom wall of the heart. So your inferior leads, the ones that are looking at the bottom, make up this bottom left corner down here. So leads two, three, and AVF. Down here is your inferior looking leads. Um, your laterals, remember that we had AVL was high lateral. Lead one was just below that. Now remember that lead one, um, if we were to draw our person again, like this, remember that lead one was made up from right arm to left arm. So lead one is coming across the top of your chest. But remember when we placed our V leads, it was V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. V6 is sitting down here under your armpit. So V6 and lead one are perfectly parallel to each other. They're both looking straight to the left, but V6 is lower on the wall than lead one would be. And then V5, remember was 22 and a half degrees towards the anterior, swinging more around the front of the heart, that direction. 
Um, so AVL is the highest lateral, then you would have one below that, you'd have V6 below that, and V5 is just inside um, V6 on that anterior wall as it comes around, but it's still very lateral looking. So one AVL, V5, V6, there are all of your lateral looking leads. Come over here, V1 through V4, remember at V1, we're at the right septum, and we continue all the way around to V4, which is more anterior. Um, and so this is kind of catching the septum um, and kind of that anterior wall of the left ventricle. And then V5 is just sitting just lateral to V4 over there.